Well, we are going to do uh, our November Q&A tonight. We've got lots of questions that came in. Let's, should we get started? Let's get started. Okay. Tommy says, hi, I've been watching Pastor Paul's videos on Genesis, which are fantastic, by the way. He mentions God speaking to him or calling someone to do something. I've heard other Christians use such language as well. Does this refer to some sort of a feeling or intuition or impulse? And if so, how can one be sure it's God and not the self or ego? Yeah, this is really kind of, you know, that age old question that we, we get pretty often, which is how can I tell uh, God's voice from my own? And, and it, 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 it comes in quite frequently and it's, you know, it's, 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 a, big, it's a big thing. Uh, right along there with how can I know the will of God? But one of the reasons I think that this, this question is so widespread among believers is that um, we are so unaccustomed to listening spiritually. You know, God wants to speak to his children spiritually. And we are not, it's just we're not practiced. We're not, we, you know, you come to the Lord and you enter into a really new dynamic of of a relationship with the Lord because um, you now re have received the Spirit of God and and through the Spirit of God, we are able to discern things uh, from the Spirit. The Word of God begins to come alive. But, but not only that, but God desires to communicate with us uh, through His Holy Spirit as well. And for a lot of people, it's not just this automatic thing that turns on in our lives where whereby I, I just, I'm suddenly tuned in, you know, perfectly to... Uh, the, the Holy Spirit. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like an unused limb, sure. You know, in 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 people's lives, and so uh, it, it's it's one of the things that we have to really nurture. And it's very it's it's difficult to even talk about. But you know, one of the things I think that is critical when it comes to knowing whether you're hearing from God or whether you're hearing your own your own voice, which is very common, is learning to quiet your soul. You know, David writes about this in one of the Psalms, and he talks about, you know, quieting his soul before the Lord. And that's frankly something that we don't do very well in, in our culture. And, and I, I think we're so busy and there's so much ah, noise just in our world that quieting our soul before the Lord is just very, very difficult. But it, I, I, I think that Christians should make it an ongoing prayer request. Sure. I really do. Lord, show me, teach me how to quiet my soul so that I can hear your voice because the still small voice of the Lord can easily get drowned out by the din of life. Mm -hmm. It really can. And, and so you got a bunch of Christians going, I don't know if this is me or if this is God. Well, you're not going to know until you start to dial down the rest of the world. And that might even mean fasting from your phone or the internet or, 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 or just getting quiet. It just, it's really necessary. Good encouragement. So Amara says, I often hear Christians refer to negative feelings or emotion as spirits. For example, the spirit of fear, spirit of anxiety, spirit of intimidation. I've even once heard someone call worldliness a spirit. I've always thought these things were internal coming from us as things we feel or experience from time to time. But by calling them spirits, it suggests to me that these things are external coming from spiritual forces and these spirits cause us to feel these things. Is referring to these feelings as spirits figurative or literal? And is this concept biblical? There was a comedian years ago that had this comedy line that the, the devil made me do it. And um, it, it was kind of interesting because it's, it's a little bit of what is going on here. There, you know, first of all, demonic spirits are real. Demonic spirits can affect us in many ways. But I think personally that Christians go way too far blaming uh, demonic spirits um, for their own issues as calling it a spirit of something. There's a spirit of uh, you know, worry or a spirit of anxiety, like she, the, the question the person was saying, um, spirit of intimidation, spirit of the world. I, you know, there are, I believe there are spirits. I, I believe that they can harass us. But the thing that we have to remember is that 
you have to, there has to be something there for a spirit to kind of grab a hold of. Exactly, right. Yeah, Paul calls it uh, uh, not giving the devil a foothold. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's that's an F NIV reference. In the ESV, it says, give no opportunity to the devil. And so the devil needs an opportunity to, to deal with things. So if somebody has a propensity for weir worry, for example, you know, the, the enemy can do that, can, can exacerbate that sort of a situation. But our sinful natures, we have to remember, uh, provide the enemy with a great target, a, a huge target. And our own personal weaknesses can give the enemy an opportunity uh, to harass us. And so we need to learn, we need to learn what our weaknesses are and how to pray about those that God would bring strength to them. And then we need to learn how to resist the devil so that he might flee from us. So that, that's so there's some prayer that needs to go on and there's some spiritual warfare that needs to go on. Some of what people say is true, but as with many things, it goes way beyond what sure. is legitimate. Good. Great. Yeah. All right, Cameron says, I have a question regarding women teaching, specifically to men. I'm struggling to see how Priscilla teaching Apollos aligns with 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. Please explain, and thank you for your ministry. You know, this is another really common question, because um, people know that in 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul said, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And then they, they, they read it, you know, in the book of Acts, how Apollos came along and and uh, Priscilla and Aquila heard him speak and realized he had some real gaps in his understanding. And the Bible tells us that they took him aside and they explained the way of God to him more fully. It doesn't say that Priscilla taught Apollos. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet that's the assumption by everybody. You know, well, uh, Priscilla taught Apollos. No, she didn't. She and Aquila sat down with him and explained what he didn't understand filled in the gaps and sent him on his way. Right. And that was not Priscilla sitting down and saying, all right, Apollos, now pay attention. I'm sure. going to teach you. They were partners in ministry. They did it, first of all, right. together as a couple. Yeah. And and so it's it's just simply not, this, this person is asking the question because it seems to them like a contradiction mm -hmm. and it's not a contradiction. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Jeannie says, I came home from a tour of Washington, D.C., and I know pride is a sin, but when I was there, I felt a deep patriotic pride in our country, our servicemen and women, but most of all, that God has blessed us with these gifts. It humbled me to my core, but I, but I know I'm wrong to feel proud. If not pride, then should I be saying grateful? Spiritual pride is evil, so was I being against God for feeling pride at that moment? And I just feel like this is a tender-hearted person that's worried she's... <laughs> had the wrong feelings going Agreed. on here. <laughs> the, the, the pride that Jeannie is, is feeling here is not the kind of pride that the Bible condemns. Yeah. Um, to feel pride in your nation because it, we, we, we have a godly heritage, which is what you see when you go to Washington, D.C. God is plastered all over the place. Right. Um, and, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. To feel, you know, pride for your child when they've done something that is, you know, virtuous or honorable there's nothing wrong with that at all. The pride that the Bible condemns is the kind of pride that you know sets itself up against the authority of God. It sets itself up against the authority even of man. It's a pride of self that says you 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 know it, it kind of refuses to be taught. It's an unteachable yeah. attitude. And spiritual pride is one of the worst kinds of pride. And she mentioned spiritual pride, and that is evil, because spiritual pride looks down on people and says, you're lesser sure. than I am. Um, but that's not what you get when you go to Washington, D.C. and look at all of the God references. Right. You can come away from that really and feel like, wow, this country that I live in has a very godly heritage. We've gotten away from it, but we have a godly heritage. And that's there's no problem feeling proud about that at all. Yeah. Uh, Natalie says, Pastor Paul, your teaching has brought the Bible alive for me, and I thank God for giving you the gifts of teaching and preaching. I have one question that I haven't heard anybody ask. Does God tell us to prepare for global disasters as preppers do? I know we're not supposed to react in fear, but should we do all that we can just in case? I really like to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you. I think everybody probably knows what preppers are, you know, people who prepare. Uh, and, and they're basically preparing for a global disaster. And so they stockpile 
food and ammunition and and uh, some of them even go so far as to you know build a bomb shelter in their property and whatever. And so it sounds like Natalie is wanting to know if that's something that the Lord would have us to do. I personally think the best preparation for any difficulty of life is a strong faith in God. Because the Bible says, you know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge God in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. And what that means to me and the way I apply that to the things like preparing is that God's going to lead me. If I'm trusting the Lord like I'm supposed to be, then if, if something is coming up that's going to be some kind of, a, you know, God's going to lead me. And, I'm, and I'm, I don't have to worry about that. So yep. I, I think a lot of what preppers do is done apart from God and trusting God, honestly. She's asking, is it wrong to prepare? So is it wrong to prepare? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that, that's what I'm trying not Does to that, answer. <laughs> because Does that show a lack of faith? And, you know, I'll, and I'll tell you why. It's not because I'm waffling. It's because people want all the time want to ask me if things are wrong. And if it's not written specifically in the Word, I'm just going to tell you what the Word says. Sure. You decide whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You pray about it. You ask the Holy Spirit. The, God's Word says, trust me with all of your heart and I'll lead you. Yep. So what do you think? It's like, I don't want to say it's wrong. I want to say, here's what the Bible says. Sure. Now, work it out. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. yeah. Anonymous person said, if you could recommend one New Testament book to someone that you felt covered basic Christian beliefs, what would it be? Can you guess this? Um, I don't know if I want to say it out loud. Okay. It I mean, be... I would say Romans. It's Colossians. Well, that was my next. Uh, that was my next. Yeah. If I if I if I gave one one book of the Bible to somebody just to really nail down basic Christian doctrine, it would be Colossians. Who is Jesus? Yeah, who is Jesus and what does he do? Yeah. And you know, Sue is telling you about my my latest book, which really just published, and it's yeah. where it's in the bookstore. After I finished writing that book, my daughter helped me write it and edit it, and it had nothing to do with her. But after we got done with the writing that, I said, that is it. That is the last book that I am ever going to and write. And we all know what those words mean. We do? Yes. I started just <laughs> this la this week writing a book on based on Colossians. Yeah. So that's, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Colossians is Colossians fantastic. is fantastic. Yep. Uh, fantastic. Sophia says, since Jesus was the Son of God here on earth, does that change in heaven? No. Jesus remains the son of God for eternity. He remains a man for eternity. The God-man on the throne. You know, yeah, that, that, when Jesus chose, when he willingly chose to be born as a human being, he chose that for eternity. That's pretty amazing. I don't think I understood that until I was well into my adult life. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ken says, hello, Sue and Pastor Paul. I was just reading Colossians this morning. Oh, and in its closing, the Apostle Paul asks that this letter be read to the church of the Laodiceans. And likewise, they read the epistle from Laodicea. Why is the epistle from Laodicea or perhaps others not included? We just didn't want to. <laughs> Ran out of room. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have room. It's like this Bible's getting really long, you guys. No, the, the letter, Paul's letter to the Laodiceans uh, got lost. You know, we believe that Paul actually wrote four letters to the Corinthians. And, and we, we believe that we have two and four yeah. based on other things that he wrote because he mentions things about what I wrote to you and we don't have those comments. And so we, yeah, we believe that, that. So there's two other letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We think we know that he wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. Those are gone. They're lost. Somebody just took them out with the trash or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Something. Yeah. Angela says, I'm sure they answer all the questions that we debate today. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Angela says, I have a question about Pastor Paul's teaching where he says people will survive the great tribulation. I assumed all those who would survive the tribulation would become believers. But then my sister had a question I didn't think of. Where, will there also be survivors who do not come to Christ? Well, you got to remember what happens at the end of the great tribulation. Jesus returns. 
and he fights for Israel. He, he puts down the enemies that come against Israel. There's this massive, you know, victory. And then Jesus takes the throne yeah. and begins to rule for a 1,000-year period. Pretty tough to be an unbeliever at that point, you know? So I, I, it's kind of like whoever is not against us is for us. Like there's going to be a dividing line. Well, the, you're, you're, yeah, I mean, yeah. and I, that's probably going to be largely Armageddon. Yeah, but the but the point is, we do know that some that during that one thousand year period of time, as there will be mortals on the earth and they will procreate, they're going to live longer than they do now. Mm -hmm. We think if somebody reaches 90, it's like, whoa, they wrote, you know, 90, 95 or something like that. Now you're like that. talking about the millennium. During the millennial kingdom. Mm -hmm. But, it, but we're, it, it says in the Bible that if someone dies at 100, they're going to be considered young. So people are going to have longer lives and they're going to procreate. And over a period of time, people are going to lose faith because Satan is going to be released at the end of the millennial kingdom. And he's going to be able to gather a one last army against the Lord. And, and we say there's going to be a final battle, but it's hardly a battle. Um, they're put down very quickly, and very easily by the Lord. But we know that he's going to gather people against the Lord. So during the millennial kingdom, people will gradually lose faith. But I think, I think at the beginning of the, or at the end of the great tribulation, the beginning of the millennial kingdom, you're not going to be able to find an unbeliever. Sure because of what they just witnessed. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Lorraine says, what does it mean to bless the Lord? He blesses us, but how can we bless him since he has everything? I would say, Lorraine, you need to get a different Bible. I, I, I shouldn't probably say that, but that's an old King Jamesism. ism uh, Bless the Lord. And, you know, people who know, and most of the people who probably read the King James know that to bless the Lord means to praise the Lord. And yet, it, it, it's used in such a way that, that people misinterpret it and they think that we're, we're supposed to be a blessing to the Lord somehow. And it's really, if you look in a more modern translation, instead of bless the Lord, it says praise the Lord. Okay. That's all. Anne says, I've just finished studying the book of Acts with you on YouTube. Often the words pagan, paganism, and deity were used. Could you please explain the meaning of these words? Okay, a pagan is a believer in, a, in many gods. Okay? okay, short short version definition of a pagan. Paganism is the practice of belief in many gods. False gods. False gods, mm -hmm. right. Uh, deity is a word we use to define the qualities and attributes of God. So if we were to say we believe in the deity of Jesus, we're saying we believe he is God or he possesses the attributes of God. Do we ever use the word deity to mean false gods? Like we use the word God to mean the one true Some, God. Sometimes, also... sometimes people will say he believes in a lot of deities. Sure. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it, it's really wrongly used, used in that context. But people wrongly use things all the time. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. All right. Ashley says, Pastor Paul, were the Pharisees Levites and our present day rabbis Levites? No. The priests of Israel were from the tribe of Levi and the branch of the tribe of Levi that came from Aaron. So Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. Then his Aaron and then his descendants became the priests and the Levites were the helpers for the priests. But the Pharisees could come from any tribe and the rabbis could come from any tribe. Gotcha. All right. At Fit Kitty says, hello, Pastor Paul and Miss Sue. I enjoy your channel very much. Previously, I learned that God set 15 judges over Israel, but lately I've read that there were just 12 judges. The difference is that Abimelech, Eli, and Samuel were left off the list of 15 that I had previously learned. The number 12 makes more sense from a biblical perspective. So could you please confirm the judges for me and why there would be two lists of judges being taught, 115 and 112? Thank you for your insight. Love from Nova Scotia, Canada. Nova Scotia. Um, okay, the, the, what, what uh, this gal is asking is, you know, why, are, why do some people say there are 12 judges of Israel and why do some people say there are 15? Here's the deal. When you read the book of Judges, it tells the story of 12 judges. Right. When you get to 1 Samuel, 
you read about Eli, who was also a judge, and you read about Samuel, who was also a judge. There, actually, in 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 in, in the um, book of Judges, there's also a reference to, and she tells about it, Abimelech, and Abimelech was the son of Gideon, who really was never a judge. He he was really just a dork, who kind of made a a, a violent power grab, after you know, Gideon passed from the scene, and he wanted to become king. Yeah, I mean that was his aspiration, not to be judge, but king. So. But he was he was he he really didn't have any t real impact, and so most people don't count him yeah. as a judge. They count the legitimate twelve judge that the, that the book of Judges talks about. So I think there are fourteen, yeah. <laughs> not twelve, not fifty. I think there are fourteen. You got twelve in the book of Judges. Then you got Eli and Samuel. Sure. And you know Eli was a judge for sure because right. it says he judged Israel yep. for forty years after he died. And then we know that Samuel was the final judge before the kings. Right. So, okay. 14. Throw in another 14, number just there. Just to make it really confusing. Yeah. There were 14. Yeah. All right. David says, when a person repents for his sins, does it need to be done publicly or can it get done privately? Well, it can. <laughs> the, the Bible, you know, uh, talks about confessing to one another, but that's really not repenting. Yeah. Um, and he's not talking about asking forgiveness here. He's talking about repenting, which in our vocabulary means to turn away from. You don't have to speak a word to repent. Right. You don't have to utter a sound to either God or man, because it really means a change of mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, 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 it can be done publicly and it can be done privately. There's not a specific... You got to do it this way, sort of a thing, you know. Yeah, in so the Bible. Pray about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Angela says, "I've been studying through the Old Testament with your YouTube teachings, and I'm learning more than I ever dreamed of. I have a question about the Jews that either repented due to the prophets' warnings, or that were already following God. Did they suffer, go into captivity?" and were treated harshly by Assyria, Babylon, or did God spare them somehow? So she's talking about the age of the kings, the generations of the kings, and those who who repented and who were soft-hearted toward God. Did they still either suffer or go into captivity? Well, you know, some some suffered because uh, because there was a there was a community of people that 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 went wrong and and sometimes when you're part of a community, and even though you may be faithful to the Lord, you may suffer because your community has. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States, you know, we, we feel like we're, our hearts are, are open to the Lord and we want to see the Lord doing what, you know, he wants to do. But w we suffer. Sure. We suffer uh, because of the godlessness, frankly, of our, our nation. Um, and then, and some people were also spared. Um, you read the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah suffered because he was a prophet, but he was faithful to God, and God spared him largely from the, the Babylonian invasion. In fact, God gave the Babylonians favor, gave Jeremiah favor, excuse me, with the Babylonians. They basically came to Jeremiah and said, hey, you can go wherever you want to go. You want to come to Babylon? You can. You want to stay here? You can. You want to go somewhere else? You can. And And so... There were people who were faithful to God who were given special favor, blessing, um, and some and some were made to suffer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Daniel and and his friends right. were hauled off to Babylon, mm -hmm. and there was and were uh, and were both at different times protected and had a and had exactly there was suffering in their lives and there was there was blessing and and yeah. favor. I think sometimes too about all the it says all the poor people were left behind to kind of work the land so yeah. it didn't fall into yeah. and I, I've often wondered how many of those were really devout God fearing people yeah. that you know the Lord did spare so yeah yeah it's very possible. Jody says, how do I respond to someone when they ask about the Trinity and they say that I'm actually worshiping three gods? Is God one being with three parts, the Father, Son, and the Spirit? Is that a good answer? <laughs> Any explanation would be helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. So how do you respond to someone who says you're worshiping three gods? The short answer is I would, I would say, Jody, just say to them, 
I worship God as he has revealed himself in the Bible. You know, you were just teaching Sunday about throwing pearls before swine. Yeah. And you were talking about some of the deeper things of yeah. the Lord. And Trinity is one of them. Yeah, the complexity of that. And that's not an argument to get into with someone who is either an unbeliever or there's other things we could be talking about. Yeah. Rather than all the nuances of the Trinity. So a yeah. simple answer. like I you usually said. tell people don't try to explain the Trinity because, first of all, you can't. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it's not going to make sense you know, to anybody, you're, and, you know, and, and all of the little things that people say, well, it's kind of like water, H2O, you've vapor. got water, you got liquid and ice and steam, and they're all water. Yeah, but that breaks down pretty fast because you can't compare the creation to the creator yeah. who is uncreated and is not like his creation. So is there a good explanation for the Trinity? No, there isn't. So the best thing you can say is, I worship God as he has revealed himself. And that's it. Yeah, that's and that it. brings it, see, that puts it in a, in a place where the person has, now has an issue with the Bible, not with you. Sure. Which and is I try always to, smart. To well, do. I try to do yeah. as much as possible. It's a good because, reminder. Yeah, because I'm not that smart. Ashley says, Pastor Paul, was John the only one who heard the Lord say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased? She must be talking about baptism. Yeah. Or was it heard by the multitude? Thank you. Do you know that the Bible doesn't say? The Bible doesn't say. And it's it's a it's an assumption to say that John heard that voice. He maybe he did, mm -hmm. but what John gave testimony of is that he saw the Spirit descend and 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 stay upon Jesus. He saw that yeah. and he was told to, to to pay attention for that. Um but it doesn't say that John specifically heard the voice from heaven. It could be that everybody that was there heard the voice from heaven. Yeah. You know, um, it, it, it's not specific. <laughs> All right. So. Melissa says, I feel so blessed to have found your teachings. Thank you. I have a question, please. If you're praying about something and it seems like God has answered your prayer, is it okay to ask God to prove it by giving a sign or is that tempting God? I'm asking because I'm trying to make sure that it's from God and not from myself. Well, I probably wouldn't say to him, prove it. I mean, just saying, you know, I, I mean, I probably wouldn't, you know, hear from God and then go, prove it. Because that sounds a little <laughs> challenging, you know. But I here the deal: that there's nothing wrong with asking God to confirm for confirmation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, asking for a confirmation, um, because He knows that you want to be sure. Yeah, and so and if you're not completely certain about something, you feel like the Lord's given you direction, but you're not positive. I don't think there's anything wrong with confirming it. We've had situations in our life where the Lord has graciously confirmed his will in ways that sometimes we didn't even ask sure. for, uh, but were done in such a way that there was just absolutely no argument. You know, I've often prayed when I, when I had a decision to make or some, something like this situation, and I feel like the Lord is kind of giving me a direction. <laughs> when I pray, I'll just say, Lord, you know how weak I am. You know how insecure I am about yeah. making decisions, and I'll just kind of spill it out and say, "Would you, would you help? Would you help me with this?" Yeah. You know, so yeah. And he knows. You see, that's the thing. That's the point of just like he knows me. He might as well just be real. Exactly. You know, it's like Lord, I'm not sure I'm hearing you. Would you please turn yeah. up the volume? Because yeah. yeah, exactly. If our kids said that to us, we'd say, "Yeah, absolutely, I will." Yeah, I would talk louder. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca says, earlier this year, my husband and I went through your marriage series, which is excellent. We fully believe that the husband is to be the spiritual leader, head of the home. If a wife feels her husband isn't taking full initiative in this role, what advice would you give to her as to how she should encourage her husband to grow in this area? Sue, how should a wife deal with it if she realizes her husband is not firing on all cylinders as it relates to his calling yeah, as I guess that's kind of a woman mentoring question isn't it, it is so yeah. well the first the first thing is you often say don't expect unbelievers to act like believers right so that's the first thing is to decide so is this husband saved well we would assume so she said they went through the marriage yeah service. but I'm not necessarily saying that this is her situation oh she, it might be someone else and yeah. look this is super common I mean in this this is a very very common situation yeah. even in Christian marriages and you know when you and you and I 
got married or uh, got came to the Lord, um, we were both kind of learning at the same pace. You were learning how to lead. I was learning how to submit. And we both had, you know. Issues. We stumbled along the way. to Now we're perfect. And so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but um, so, okay, what would, let's say you're counseling a, a, a wife. Because here's the deal. If yeah. a husband is not fulfilling his role, she's going to notice. Sure. The wife is always going to notice. Yeah. yeah. So um, I would, you know, I would, if I was sitting down with, with a woman that was in this situation and she just didn't feel like her husband was taking either, she might have too high standards and might need to just be a little bit You'd more You'd have to find patient. out what's going on. You'd, find out what's You'd going have to ask some questions. Um, the other thing is I would, the, some of the things I'd encourage her not to do is lead him in leading, <laughs> yeah. like, and not instruct him in all the Sit good down, ways. Sit down, Buster. We need to talk about your to job. Lead. So don't do that. Don't don't instruct. I would also say don't expect him to lead like a woman would lead. Lead, and like what I mean by that is often women have a certain way of our spiritual lives. Like take devotions, for example. Men don't do their devotional time like women do their devotional time. No. So I always say I don't, don't have a pink notebook. Oh, I mean, we do like we we're just different. We're God made us different. And so don't expect men to lead a devotional life in the word like well, it's it's going to look differently. Yeah. Um. So what I'm working up to is there's a lot of things just don't don't expect this. I would say, look, focus on your own part. Yep. Focus on your part. And really pray. And if you have a mature woman in your life that you can kind of pray through this, and that's good. I think that kind of mentoring is really good. Um, but it's just this, it's this would be the same answer as if you have a, a child that's estranged from you. There's not a lot you can, you can't say anything about it. You just need to pray and intercede and wait for, wait for the Lord to do that work. Mm -hmm. So a couple of don't do's, but the biggest do is just really make it a matter of prayer. So the two things to do are make sure you're doing your part to be respectful to him, yep. to be submissive to him in the home, and then really make it a concentrated matter of prayer and, you know, get a mentor with you. Yeah. So. You know, I, I read that note on Sunday from a gal that, that said that as she got into the word, her husband took note sure. of how she was digging into the scriptures yeah. and he started, he was encouraged by that. Sure. The and first I, and Peter. You, you know, yeah, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, yeah. Peter talks about that. He says, you know, wives, if you, if any of you has a husband that, that doesn't believe the word and that doesn't necessarily mean he's an unbeliever because there are areas of the word that a believing man can stumble over. Yeah. And, and so the, the word to wives there in, in Peter was, let him be won over without words when he sees your life, the sure. godliness and the desire of your life. So, and, and I think a lot of ladies forget that their example. Sometimes it boils down to just little baby steps and sometimes even comic principles. I, I remember reading years ago in the 90s, a book by Elizabeth George, when she was learning how to let her husband lead, and he wanted the family to get donuts on the way to church on Sunday mornings. So that was kind of one of his little nuances of leading. Like she's every like, Sunday? Yeah. She's like, no, they have white dresses. It's chocolate. Like, no, we can't do this. I like and, that. And she had to, we, we can do it if you want. But she had to come to, the Lord had to show her that he was leading and she was chopping it down with an ax. And so in her book, she wrote about how she learned to say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a funny little story, but there are a lot of ways where a husband may be trying to lead and, and she's not wife, letting him and she's not letting and not yeah. seeing, but this is a baby step, like getting the, the kids in the car, stop it for donuts, get to church, let him lead. You Let know, him what, do it. You yeah. can wash the dresses. <laughs> when I'm doing uh, marriage counseling or pre-marriage counseling, one of the things I share with couples is that most couples get married and spend the majority of their lives together trying to get the sure. other person to think and act like them. Yep. And and that's just and this a reality, you know, because we relate, we relate to life yeah. on the level in which we do, and we kind of want the other person to relate on that same level, and they don't. And so we want them to react the way we do and on and on and on. And 
it can really come into play when it comes to this whole issue of marriage from a biblical perspective. Sure. And so anyway, good answer. Well, thank good you. answer. <laughs> I always say that to you. That was very nice. Dawn <laughs> says, I'm so thankful for your monthly Q&A sessions. In one of your teachings, you said that women should not teach men. Is this only for religious teaching, or does that also mean that women should not be college professors? Paul was writing to the church when he said, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. And that is his intention was in the church. And she had a second question. In your study of Matthew, you mentioned that God does not recognize divorce. So if you have remarried before knowing this, should you divorce? Thank you so much. Well, it is incorrect to say that God does not recognize divorce. He does recognize divorce. The Bible tells us, in fact, Jesus is very clear on that, that when there has been uh, sexual immorality and unfaithfulness within a marriage, um, that there is a a freedom, not a command, but a freedom um, to, to divorce and that God would recognize that divorce because then if they remarry, they are, you know, that person is free to do so. Um, so that's the, first, that's the first thing. So what she's asking here, bless her heart, is if you now realize that you divorce in the past and now you're remarried, and you realize that you didn't divorce for biblical reasons, right. should you now divorce from the person to whom you're married to correct that? And that's the old thing of thinking that two right or two wrongs add up to a right. Um, God hates divorce. You know, you, you got divorced for unbiblical reasons. You remarried. Now you come to learn that that divorce was wrong you confess it, you get forgiveness, and you move on in the marriage in which you are now connected. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Be faithful. Yep. Sister says, I live in Africa where polygamy is rampant. This has gotten me wondering whether children of God are allowed to practice polygamy or not. If not, I would like to hear your thoughts on why God gave David multiple wives and why the Apostle Paul mentioned that an overseer must be a husband of one wife if polygamy should not be practiced. When you look into the Word of God, you first of all find out that the very first reference of polygamy takes place uh, from one of the descendants of Cain, mm -hmm. the ungodly line of Cain. That's a very important place to start understanding the context of polygamy uh, because, you know, this man named Lamech descended from Cain and took two wives and bragged about it and, and stuff like that. So, when Jesus came along and spoke on marriage, he made it clear that God's original intent from the beginning, he said, uh, it was God intended for a man to be joined to his wife, not wives, but to his wife, and the two should become one flesh. He makes that very clear. It's not three, five, 10, or 15. So we know that God originally did not intend polygamy to take place. Why he chose to bear with polygamy in the Old Testament, God doesn't explain. Mm -hmm. And where God doesn't give an explanation, I'm not about to venture one because that's going beyond what is written. Uh, all I know is that he bore with it for a period of time. Um, I certainly wouldn't take his silence, however, on a subject as approval. Right. Uh, that would be very foolish indeed. So, yeah. There you go. Pearl says, hello, I live in South Africa. I found God through your channel, and I'm Praise so grateful. I know. I am now a born-again child of God. Here is my question. How do we balance having faith when praying while also allowing for God's will in our lives? For example, praying for a job. Do I pray believing that the job is already mine, even if I don't know if it's God's will for me to get that job? And I feel like that is, that her, the way she phrased that statement is something that's um, purpose. What, what am I looking for? Is is taught. Yeah. You you're not praying with faith if you don't say it's already mine. Right. You know. Yeah. I remember a number of years ago we we uh, were going to a church. And I've mentioned this that when when Sue and I started walking with the Lord, the church we went to was a charismatic church and it had some strong Pentecostal roots and and um, there was a lady that came up to the pastor one time 
just uh, covered with a rash. And I mean, it was like alarming. And, uh, you know, she came and walked up to him and started talking. And he said, my dear, how long have you had this rash? And she said, I don't have a rash. And of course, she was under the uh, mistaken idea that if you confess it, sure. then you're going to continue to deal with it. And that it's kind of that whole word faith confession thing, you know, you speak it and it becomes a reality. And so she, what she was saying is, I'm going to speak my healing. And that's a little bit of what Pearl is getting at here. Sure. As I'm praying for a job, should I just say to people, oh, I've got a job even before I've been hired because that she's, she's been learning, like you said, that that is an expression of faith to say, I have a job. It hasn't manifested yet, <laughs> but I have a job because I prayed about it and I believe that God has given me that job. I don't know where I'm going to work. I don't know anything about it, but I have a job. You know, I, I believe that we're supposed to pray believing that God is faithful and that he promises to lead those who trust in him with all of their hearts, as we've already mentioned. But you know, the fact of the matter is we often don't know exactly how God's going to answer sure. our prayers. Yeah. We just don't know. And, and because of that, we come off sounding really dumb if we start speaking with presumption where God hasn't, you know, responded yet. So I believe we're to pray with faith, but our, we're to believe that God loves us. We're to believe that God is going to provide however he chooses to provide but not get presumptive about it, or sure. you know what I'm saying? Uh, presumptuous, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, ab about the specific way that God is going to do it. He, when Jesus taught about provision, he just said, trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he said, look at the birds, look at the flowers. They're not getting an ulcer, and yet God provides for them, right? Mm -hmm. So just don't worry. And that, that was the word Jesus kind of left it. So I think that's what we should do is just say, I've prayed about it. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm not sure how he's going to provide, Yeah, but I'm trusting. Good. Adriano says in Romans 3, the righteous through faith video. He's probably referring to something that I talked about. I think about. that's maybe the title of the video. It yeah. could be. Uh, you say how the people before Jesus were still saved through faith from God's judgment. Right. My question is, what was their faith in if they did not know who Jesus was yet? Good question. It is a good question. Mm -hmm. But they were they were trusting that God was going to forgive them. Yeah. Period. They, their faith was in God's love and forgiveness. Yep. And it, it just the 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 focus of of how that was all paid for eventually was manifested when Jesus came, died on the cross, and rose again. But they were just trusting trusting that the Lord would forgive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And here's our last question. Interesting one. Wow. I have a question. Robert says. He has a question. What do you think about the number of the beast being 616 instead of 666? I got the information from the Dead Sea Scrolls that have Revelation 13, 18 saying that the mark of the beast is 616. They say that 666 came from man's translation, not biblical terms. Well, the first thing that I want to address is they say. <laughs> you know, we've talked about this yeah. in the past. They are often wrong, whoever they are. And they say that 666 came from man's translation. My question is, what isn't man's translation? I mean, it, the, the New Testament was written in Greek. So you got to translate it. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, 666 is a really good translation of what is written in the Greek. Because what is written there is actually of the numerical value of 660 and 6. And so you just you just add them up. And 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 honestly there from what I understand there's only one reference uh of 616 and all the rest are 666. So the the manuscript evidence in favor of 666 is overwhelming. That's the first thing that I want to I want to say. I um so what do I think about 616? I think it's 666. And the reason I believe that is because it, you know, we forget sometimes that that's man's number. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible actually says there in Revelation. This is man's number. And the reason that I believe 
666 is used is because it's one short of God. You know, God, God's number seven. Yeah. Seven is the number of completion in the Bible. So, you know, God does things in sevens and there you see that repeated over and over again. So along comes the beast, the false prophet and the Antichrist, which is the unholy trinity uh, that is going to dominate during the Great Tribulation. And he's going to desire to be worshipped, but he's never going to achieve seven. It's only ever going to be six, six, six. And, and, and you know, it's basically a way of just saying he falls short. Right. He's going to he's going to claim to be God, but he's not. He falls short. And and by the way, this is kind of an aside, but I think a lot of people wrongly conclude that 666 is going to be the mark of the beast. It, it, the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that's the mark of the beast. It says that's the number mm -hmm. of the beast. So his number is 666. The mark of the beast is something that's going to be forced on people to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's 666. You know, you see these pictures, you know, 666 yeah. on their yeah. forehead or on their hand, you know, and it's like, where'd you get that? Because that's it's not what it says. So anyway, six means close, but no cigar. Yep. Is the bottom line. So. Well, good. That's a wrap. It is. That's it. Wow. 25 questions. That's what came in in November. So there you go. So let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather tonight and just ponder the word of God. Lord, I, I'm, I'm thankful that people ask questions because they're good questions. And that means that they want to know and they're longing for answers. And Lord, I'm, I'm also thankful that you've given us your word that gives us answers to questions. I'm just really thankful, Father, that we can look into the Word and we can, we can see what it says and we can have our questions answered, many of them anyway, and, and, and be able to be better for it. And so, Lord, help us to keep digging in, to keep desiring to know, to yearn and to grow and to hunger and to thirst for understanding. Because, Lord, I believe that that pleases you very much and, and that you long to pour out wisdom and understanding. And thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who is the, the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would continue to fill us up with grace and understanding. And we look to you to do that, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. Amen. Amen.